Before I start, I would like to thank a number of people, starting with uh, Mr. Talat Othman, who is the sponsor of this uh, lecture. And I want to thank Professor uh, Fred Doner, as well as uh, uh, Tom McGuire, who has helped in the logistics and the organization of the talk. And thank you all for coming. It's a great privilege to be able to, to address uh, uh, such a group here. Uh, the, the title of my talk is When Islamists Rule, and uh, the subtitle talks about economic policies. And uh, the reason why I got interested in that subject is that for all the talk about Islam, uh, and there are many, many misconceptions about Islam, as you know, uh, and uh, the kind of misconceptions that we often talk about uh, get even worse when it gets to economics. So I've always been interested in that subject. And with my prior work on uh, Islamic finance, uh, I was able to, to get a better sense of historically how uh, economic thinking has evolved. But uh, the other part of the subtitle is uh, between ideology and pragmatism. And a big part of what you'll hear today suggests a great deal of uh, pragmatism. So uh, f now that uh, following the Arab Spring, there are a number of uh, governments uh, in the Middle East uh, that uh, include and sometimes are led by Islamists, it's a very interesting uh, question to, to explore. So, the, the first comment I want to make is uh, that what people say about uh, economics, especially when they are in the opposition, uh, does not necessarily uh, prefigure what it is that they'll do once they govern. But this is not uh, specific to, to Islam. It's actually the whole dynamic of being in the opposition as opposed to having to, uh, to, 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 to rule. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that uh, there is um, a very central paradox to the question of economic Islam, which is that on the one hand, if you look at the root causes of most revolutions, and that was true of the Iranian revolution in 1979, uh, and it's certainly true of the Arab Spring, the causes are largely economic. But at the same time, the um, economic aspect tends to be a very small part of the immediate preoccupation of whoever gets to power. So here's, again, a very central paradox to that question. And to illustrate that, I want to give you a couple of uh, famous quotes from the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, on the matter of, uh, of economics. Uh, one famous comment was uh, right after the, the revolution in Iran, at one point he was asked about uh, the, uh, the question of inflation and lowering the price of foodstuffs. And uh, he had a, a comment to the effect that we didn't have this revolution to lower the price of watermelons. There's another comment that he's made that's even more explicit. And uh, he said, economics is for donkeys. OK, so uh, these, again, uh, summarize uh, the, the place of economics uh, in uh, the, the overall uh, policy of uh, any new Islamist regime. Now, the thing that uh, helps understand this paradox is that typically cultural issues tend to be far more important than economic ones, and political issues uh, also tend to be much more important than the economic ones. So the economic issues tend to be left to second-tier political uh, figures in that if you were to look at most of the Arab Spring revolutions, you don't see many economists who led the charge uh, for uh, regime change, etc. So typically what you have 
is fairly bland technocrats who run uh, the, the economy and make, uh, make economic uh, decisions. So again, uh, the causes tend to be largely economic, but if you look at the reality of, uh, of governance, uh, economic issues tend to be rather uh, secondary. The other thing to uh, understand in terms of trying to focus on Islam and economics, in other words, if you're trying to uh, define what Islam has to say about economics, uh, then you'll realize uh, that uh, Islam is not terribly specific on the kind of economic issues that we tend to think about. Uh, more specifically, uh, if you look at uh, the d various discourses on economic uh, Islam, uh, you always have uh, a utopian uh, discourse about uh, how wonderful the economy would be uh, under an Islamic uh, regime uh, without a whole lot of detail. But this is also true of other ideologies. Uh, another way of, um, of looking at um, the connection between Islam and economics is basically to say that Islam is compatible with a number of Western-style economic ideologies. Okay, let me, me be more specific here. Uh, and uh, in, in the 1970s, if you were to look at the intellectual life of the Iranian opposition. Uh, many of the opposition figures uh, were in those days uh, studying in the universities of the US, but uh, more frequently of, uh, of Paris. And uh, a number of figures who ended up being very close to the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, would be what we would call today leftists. And um, the economic side of their arguments was very much in line with what um, anybody would expect of leftists. And that view came to color the, many of the economic policies of the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran, although it usually falls under the heading of populism. Uh, let me be a bit more specific. I'm sure there are some of you here who, uh, who know uh, a lot about, uh, about Iran. And I want to single out two names in terms of those uh, uh, thinkers uh, who were influenced by leftist uh, writers. Uh, who were very much in vogue in the 1960s. Uh, one of them is uh, Ali Shariati, who died in 1977, but he was something of a mentor uh, to many of the revolutionaries at the time of uh, 1978, 70, 79, and he did have quite a bit of uh, impact on the Ayatollah Khomeini's regime. There's another name that used to be very well known, and it's probably be known to only uh, older people in this crowd, and the name is uh, Abul Hassan Bani Sadr. Now, Bani Sadr was the first uh, president of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Therefore, he was a figure of some importance, although uh, he did not stay long in uh, power. He was forced to resign and has been living in exile uh, in France for a very long time. Uh, now, uh, when you do a PhD, sometimes you end up reading stuff that is extremely tedious and boring. And in my case, while I was doing my research on Islamic finance, I ended up looking at uh, some of uh, his writings and uh, to give you just uh, briefly a flavor of what it is that he had to say, he pretty much argued that Marxism 
uh, is uh, very much in line with the Islamic uh, view of, of economics. And uh, to make things even more interesting, he asserted that the notion of Tawheed, uh, which should be familiar to, to most of you, actually referred to a Marxist reading of, uh, of, uh, of, of history. So uh, here you can see that there are some Islamists whom you would pro probably classify as being uh, left-wingers. And in terms of uh, the scriptural evidence behind these views, uh, there was essentially the centrality of the notion of justice in uh, the Quran, in the Hadith, etc., And therefore, there was this view that uh, justice is uh, a central concern. And economic justice would uh, suggest, uh, again, left-wing, if not outright Marxist uh, positions on the economy. So that was, uh, again, the, uh, the situation in Iran and uh, nowadays, uh, you, you can see that very often you have these kinds of views that, uh, that reappear. Because again, things are more complex than simply to say that uh, in Iran, the, uh, the, the government adopts uh, left-wing uh, policies. Because if we jump a few years after the uh, Iranian Revolution, and we look at another country, the Sudan, which uh, has gone through uh, very Islamist uh, phases, then there's a name that probably doesn't uh, mean anything to, to anybody in this uh, uh, audience here. And the name of that person is uh, Abdul Rahim Hamdi. And uh, who was he? Well, he was the Minister of Finance of the Sudan in 1992 and 1993. Now, the interesting thing about him was that he was a great admirer of Milton Friedman. Okay, so that's an appropriate name to mention here in, the, uh, in this university. And uh, it, uh, it, it suggests, uh, again, the fact that you can have just like there were some left-wing uh, strands in terms of uh, Islamic economic thinking, there were also some that you would call uh, right-wing and uh, that would uh, uh, nowadays uh, fall in line with neoliberal prescriptions. Now, you may ask yourself, okay, how could it be so? Well, uh, the Quran itself is a very rich text. Uh, and it is open to lots of interpretations. And some thinkers choose to focus on the idea of justice and uh, how this could be uh, put in practice, whereas others uh, could choose to focus on other aspects of, of uh, Islam and the Islamic tradition. Okay? One such uh, aspect that is extremely important in the Islamic tradition is commerce and private property, okay? And so uh, in terms of uh, kind of that would please many people that came out of the University of Chicago School of Economics about the sanctity of private property as well as the sanctity of contracts that, that goes with that, you could see that there's a strand within Islam that focuses on that. And this is not far-fetched. If you look at the origins of Islam, and the role that was played by merchants uh, in uh, the Islamic tradition. Now, the Prophet Muhammad himself was a merchant, as were his four immediate uh, successors. So the city of Mecca was a center of trade, and so merchants came to play a very important role. Uh, I, I could go down the list of uh, the role that was played by uh, commerce and merchants in the uh, Islamic uh, tradition, including the fact that in many parts of the world, uh, the conversion to Islam came not through the sword, but through merchants who very often were uh, working hand in hand with uh, religious preachers. 
uh, and uh, you could also look, if you look at the of at Islamic jurisprudence, the fact that some important figures, uh, Abu Hanifa being one who is the father of the uh, Hanafi uh, school of jurisprudence, was himself a merchant. So, and typically merchants uh, tend to have an interest in uh, matters of, uh, of commerce and their uh, worldview would be more likely to be, again, if we, lose, uh, if we use today's uh, vocabulary, uh, be, pol uh, be uh, economically uh, conservative, okay? So this is one aspect of economic Islam, which is that it, is, uh, it could accommodate more than one economic uh, perspective, okay? The other thing that you should know about, uh, about Islam and the Islamic tradition is that uh, on matters of uh, transactions and commerce, uh, Islam uh, and, uh, again, relationship among, uh, among people as opposed to relationships between man and God, which would fall under the, uh, the, the, the category of... Uh, the, the, the religious uh, features, uh, but then you have what is called the uh, mu'amalat, uh, which is basically the human transactions. And in that realm, uh, there is a, a wide scope for interpretation. To give you three examples of the kinds of adaptive mechanisms that would uh, allow departure from some of the fixed uh, principles, uh, there is the principle of, uh, out of, which usually is translated as custom, uh, which was part of uh, early Islam and the early conquests, uh, in that uh, there was uh, the view that uh, some of the conquered people could maintain some of their uh, uh, traditions as long as they don't clash with the basic uh, Islamic principles. Uh, there are two other concepts that are uh, even more significant in terms of the later Islamic history. One is the principle of maslaha, which would translate as the public interest uh, and which was uh, often uh, invoked by uh, 19th century uh, Islamic uh, modernists. Uh, in terms of uh, trying to assess the relevance of many of the innovations that were brought by colonialism. So there was this test of uh, maslaha, which was quite uh, significant. There's another one, which is uh, darura, uh, which is uh, the overriding necessity. So when something is absolutely necessary, then uh, darura, can be uh, invoked even uh, when some of the basic principles of Islam are being transgressed. Let me give you a practical illustration of how uh, darura could, uh, could be invoked. Uh, let's go back to the case of Iran, which is a significant one, uh, mostly because it is the oldest experience of uh, of, of an Islamic uh, revolution, whereas most other case studies are too recent to draw uh, significant conclusions from. So in the case of, uh, of Iran, shortly after the revolution in 1979 uh, and the departure of the Shah, uh, there was a big uh, debate within Iran about what to do with the Shah's vast wealth, as well as that of his cronies. And uh, the majority of religious figures in uh, Iran in those days were arguing that uh, uh, it is totally un-Islamic to seize or confiscate somebody else's private property. So uh, a number of religious figures in Iran were therefore saying we should figure something else out. We could not simply seize his uh, property. 
And uh, here the Ayatollah Khomeini, as often, although he was in a minority, he ended up prevailing, mostly because, uh, again, in terms of his political skills, he outmaneuvered uh, most of the other uh, religious figures, even some that were more senior than he was from a, a religious uh, standpoint. And the Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, argument was that this is one case where uh, Darura imposes itself. And uh, again, the Persian transliteration was Zarura, but that was uh, the same word. And what he argued was that if we allow the Shah of Iran to maintain his wealth, uh, then he will have more power within, uh, the, within Iran, and he'll be in a position to overthrow the Islamic Republic. So here, if you look at the hierarchy of, uh, of issues, clearly the survival of the uh, Islamic Republic uh, would be more significant than the question of, uh, uh, of uh, again, taking somebody's uh, property uh, away from him. So uh, this gives you a sense both of uh, the broad spectrum of economic perspectives that could be accommodated by Islamists uh, if we are to follow the religious texts, as well as the adaptive mechanisms that have existed. And uh, another of my uh, book uh, projects, uh, actually, I, uh, uh, the, the book should have been out about four years ago or so. It was titled Islam and Economics. But uh, when the uh, Arab Spring started, I contacted my publisher and said it's probably better to wait a few years before the book comes out. Otherwise, it will be instantly obsolete because it's about Islam and economics. And now we have this possibility of uh, seeing all those uh, real, uh, real life uh, and real time uh, experiments in uh, in economic uh, Islam. So the book should be out uh, now probably in a couple of years or so. And uh, so in the course of writing that book, I tried to look at uh, the Islamic experience in general. And uh, when anybody does that, one realizes that uh, there were kind of, there was quite a bit of diversity in the way in which uh, economic, uh, matters were, uh, were addressed. There are a few constant features, though. Uh, for example, the centrality of uh, zakat in the economy. Uh, but now, in the way in which zakat, which is almsgiving, was, uh, was interpreted, tended to vary over time, although uh, the Quran and the Hadith are quite specific about uh, what zakat should be. The reality of Islamic economic history is that there were certain caliphs uh, that were known to overtax their people and stretched this notion of zakat as well as uh, uh, other uh, taxes uh, in, in ways that were not at all comparable with what other uh, rulers have, have done. So this element of diversity is extremely important to, uh, to understand. Now, let's look at uh, what is happening now in a country like uh, Egypt. And uh, the easy way of uh, trying to figure out, uh, again, what is the respective importance of ideology uh, and of uh, pragmatism would be to separate two notions. One would be text and the other one would be context. And uh, the one thing uh, that we're likely to see in, uh, in the near future uh, is that context uh, probably tells us more about what uh, an Islamic uh, regime would do than the text, again, for reasons that I just uh, explained. And here we can look at uh, the experience of uh, the Muslim brothers in, in Egypt. Now, as you know, the current uh, president of Egypt 
uh, is a member of that uh, party. And uh, everybody's trying to figure out uh, what it is that he'll be doing in, in practice. And here there's one element that uh, tended to play an important symbolic role in the early days of the Arab Spring in uh, Egypt. And it is the question of the IMF and the IMF uh, loans. So uh, there were a couple of sets of reasons why all Islamists in, uh, in Egypt, and actually more so the, the Nur party, which is the more uh, extremist uh, Islamist movement in, uh, in Egypt, uh, whereas the Muslim brothers are regarded as a mainstream, um, the Nur party was more virulent on that score, but the, uh, the Muslim brothers were equally adamant at first uh, by saying that from now on, the IMF will not be dictating e uh, Egypt's economic policy. So one of the arguments was about the power of the IMF to impose its will on, uh, on Egypt, and that has been uh, the pattern uh, historically. There was also the question of the interest-based loans, the fact that uh, uh, there's, uh, these are loans at uh, a given rate of interest was regarded as uh, riba. And riba here, parenthetically, is usually translated as, as interest, although the uh, uh, the literal meaning of the word is simply increase, uh, but uh, there have been a number of instances where uh, Muslim scholars would get together and try to, uh, to decide what the meaning is, most recently with the Fiqh Academy, uh, where uh, the consensus of the scholars was that riba is interest, no matter how small the rate of interest is. So, the, uh, there were those two arguments that were used uh, by uh, the Muslim brothers as well as um, by, uh, by the Nur party. And um, a similar phenomenon, uh, w although more timidly, I would say, uh, happened in Tunisia, where the Annahda party, which is also uh, a mainstream uh, Islamic party uh, was raising uh, similar objections to uh, the aid that was received from, uh, from international development banks. And uh, all this was shortly after the revolutions and when those parties were still in the opposition. Okay, so the interesting question becomes what happened when those parties came to govern? And uh, here you can see, uh, again, why everything I was talking about earlier was uh, relevant. Because uh, right now, the official position of Egypt on the matter of IMF loans is that uh, Islamically, that would, would be OK. Okay, and uh, the, um, uh, the, the basic argument that has been uh, put forward w is a maslaha argument, an uh, interest uh, or general interest uh, argument. Uh, in this instance, it was uh, that the loan, which is I think 4.8 million, uh, f sorry, 4.8 billion US dollars, uh, that the alternative to that uh, loan, and, and one could also raise the issue of Darura as well, the, uh, uh, the kind of overriding necessity argument, uh, that uh, first of all, uh, there are no alternatives. As it's gonna be either that or nothing else. And then there were some theoretical alternative, and I'll talk in a few minutes about Islamic finance. There's another alternative, which would have been the so-called sukuk. And sukuk gets translated as Islamic bonds. So it functions like a bond, 
except that it is structured in, uh, in a uh, Sharia compliant way. And so in the case of Sukuk, uh, there, was, um, there was again a whole literature and a whole series of debates within Egypt uh, about the issuance of such uh, sukuk. The main problem is that there's no legislation in place that would uh, essentially allow the issuance of, uh, of sukuk. So it is not really a feasible alternative at this point. But then there's the other uh, set of arguments about why the IMF uh, loan uh, would be acceptable under the current circumstances. And it is that it would be much cheaper for Egypt to uh, get this uh, loan from the IMF than to go on the market, on the open market, because as you can imagine, uh, Egypt is, uh, uh, is still perceived by the international investors as, uh, uh, as, as, as a risky country to invest in. Uh, therefore, uh, if uh, one were to envisage uh, the issuance of uh, normal uh, debt, uh, let alone, again, the Islamic one, which is not really feasible at this point, uh, then you would look at uh, the IMF alone as an acceptable uh, alternative, okay? So what th this tells us is that the element of pragmatism will probably be a significant part, probably more significant than whatever the, the text would say. And we've seen that the texts themselves uh, can accommodate more than one uh, political economic uh, interpretation. Okay? Uh, having said that, religion is still quite important uh, in terms of uh, its economic consequences. For one thing, there's only the possibility of mobilizing certain groups uh, once you introduce uh, religion. So uh, here again, if we go back to the case of uh, Iran, we can see that uh, re uh, religion remains the main leg legitimating factor for, for the regime. So uh, whenever uh, a party or a leader uh, has uh, religion on, on his side, uh, then it tends to carry uh, more uh, weight. Although, from a broader political economic standpoint, uh, you could see the same phenomenon when religion is not involved. So in other words, uh, you're, uh, th there's an essential pragmatism in terms of dealing with, uh, with economic issues that one can see anywhere, including in the US, if you consider the fact that at the time of the financial crisis, it is the George W. Bush administration that decided to inject huge amounts of money into the financial sector and to nationalize companies like, uh, uh, like AIG and et cetera. Although one could argue that this was not the, uh, the, the, what, what you would associate ideologically with that uh, government, okay? So, the other reason why uh, uh, religion can still be an important variable has to do with the new phen uh, phenomenon, which is that in the last um, few decades, especially in the Sunni world, uh, there is some kind of forming orthodoxy in terms of economic policy of Islamist governments. Uh, and uh, there are a number of institutions and tools that have appeared. Uh, again, in a, in a minute, I'll talk about uh, Islamic finance, uh, whereby it becomes a ready reference for any Islamist uh, regime to, to use and apply. Um, but before talking about Islamic finance, I want to talk about one country which has served as a model of sorts, especially in the Sunni world, because here again, there's the Sunni Shia uh, cleavage, which would explain why uh, what Iran has done is not immediately uh, being uh, applied or, uh, or recognized even uh, in the Sunni world. And it's the example of Turkey. 
Uh, the fact that uh, in Turkey there is uh, an Islamist party that has been in power and has generally produced uh, good results, uh, whenever you look at uh, polls and surveys, uh, etc., coming out of the Arab Spring countries, you see that uh, the, the big uh, hero of many of those uh, uh, revolutions or political changes in the, uh, in the Arab world is, uh, again, uh, Turkey. Uh, and it is because uh, there is an element of religion that is quite significant, although, again, it is a, quite a pragmatic approach to uh, mixing uh, religion and uh, economics. Now to Islamic uh, finance. One of the constant features of all uh, Islamic or Islamist uh, parties is that all of them have in their uh, platform before any elections spoken of the need to introduce Islamic uh, finance. And uh, I've had a couple of interesting experiences in the past few months, uh, including one where uh, I, I happened to be in Tunisia. And uh, I was asked to uh, address uh, the Tunisian uh, parliament, or at least the, uh, the, the one uh, segment of the parliament. Basically, it was the finance committee within the, uh, what, what plays the role of a, of, a, of a parliament right now in this transition period. And so I was asked lots of interesting questions by uh, those uh, parliamentarians in uh, Tunisia, who, uh, many of whom, because there is still, despite the dominance of Annahda, a number of staunch secularists uh, in uh, Tunisia who are skeptical of any uh, Islamic or Islamist uh, solution. And the one example that I, um, I stressed when I was talking to them was the case of Malaysia, where uh, Islamic finance was not a Trojan horse for uh, political and religious extremists. Rather, it was mostly a tool of inclusion. Uh, meaning that there are a number of people who are, uh, for, who for, for religious reasons, do not, uh, do not want to deal with banks. And once uh, you propose some financial instruments that are Sharia compliant, it is a, quite an attractive uh, proposition. Uh, the, um, the, the other reason, uh, again, why uh, Islamic uh, finance is appealing is that there are a few products, a few financial products that have been tested uh, through Islamic banks. And these products could play a role in a number of areas. Uh, on the matter of poverty alleviation, uh, there is uh, Islamic microfinance, uh, which uh, is uh, an attractive uh, alternative. In terms of infrastructure financing, uh, there is the uh, Sukuk uh, that uh, also have been tried and worked uh, relatively well in a number of places. So increasingly, there is such a thing as uh, a, an economic orthodoxy, if you will, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of Islam and which was not the case uh, er early on. So one possible argument that could be made uh, would be that uh, what I was saying earlier about the fact that uh, Islam can uh, accommodate different uh, f kinds of economic ideologies may not necessarily be true in, uh, in the future. Now that there is a body of uh, thought and some institutions that, uh, the, the, that, that have been uh, used in, in practice. So I'm going to stop here and uh, take uh, questions. I thank you all for coming. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.
about Islamic economy, there is a whole family which is well known in India for generations uh, coming, uh, coming out of 18th century. Mm -hmm. Shah work is known, very well known. And especially Professor Fazlur Rahman, who was a scholar uh, in University of Chicago in the CMES department, he sponsored a PhD thesis on Shah Allah. And uh, there is a scholar by name, Professor Marcia Hermanson. She is a professor at Loyola University. Her PhD thesis is on Shah Allah. So you did not mention about that. So maybe. Yeah, uh, actually, again, the title of my talk was When Islamists Rule. So uh, my focus has been on government policies, especially in the context of the Arab Spring, which is why this is uh, kind of a, a relevant uh, topic. So there's been a lot of uh, writing and thinking about, uh, about uh, economic uh, Islam. But uh, again, my focus uh, was more on like once they reach government, because for example, you say that in India that was very influential, but that was certainly not translated into policy in terms of, uh, of government. So the ideas have always been there. And one could argue that uh, in terms of uh, the lives of individuals and families, it's, uh, there was always this Islamic component that was there. But that was not really uh, my focus. Hi, I just, uh, is this working? Yes. Um, I know nothing about Islamic finance and actually nothing about any kind of finance, really. Um, but one of the things that has always struck me uh, in thinking about what Islamic finance might look like is the uh, long-standing prohibition against riba, against interest or you know, which is such a central part, usually, of financial operations. So how is it that, uh, you know, as a, a more developed Islamic finance system emerges, how do they get around this problem? Do they use old tricks like the double sale, or what do they do exactly? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a very important question. Uh, the first point to be made is that certainly all three monotheistic religions have very comparable prohibitions uh, against uh, interest, although over time uh, many of those have fallen by the wayside. If you look at the Christian tradition, uh, usury was the, a huge sin uh, during the Middle Ages. And then with the Reformation, there was a new approach which tended to separate uh, interest, uh, which was regarded as necessary and not predatory, and usury, whereby usury uh, would be the, um, uh, again, the predatory form of interest, would be an excessive form of interest. In the Islamic world, there have been some strands that have followed that view, but they remained a minority. So when Islamic finance as a, as a reality with lots of Islamic banks, etc., appeared, which was roughly in the mid-1970s, uh, the idea was not to deal directly in interest, and uh, the idea was that there were a number of instruments that were acceptable to Sharia scholars, although not necessarily ideal. The ideal form of uh, financing in the Islamic tradition was always profit and loss sharing, which uh, historically has been called the mudaraba. So in other words, if you look at the way in which uh, many of the trading caravans were financed, the, um, the main form of financing was uh, this association of capital and labor, whereby a rich merchant typically would be the financier, and then they'd be the agent or the actual merchant who'd be conducting the business, uh, who, uh, who would be the, the person who would physically uh, be executing the, the business transaction. So this alliance of the two, uh, would be based on a, a prior agreement to divide their profits and losses accordingly. That's the ideal. Now, in reality, people with money uh, would usually prefer to receive a certain uh, sum. That's why, and there's a famous uh, uh, line by Maxime Rodinson about that, which is, 
that the reason why there was in many cultures and including the Islamic culture, there was so much talk about this question of interest is that uh, it was constantly violated in practice. And therefore it was something that uh, was a matter of concern. And the way in which it was done in practice was through uh, one uh, method which is called uh, murabaha. And under murabaha, the, the financial institution acts as a merchant and therefore is compensated uh, through a rate of profit. Now, many economists look at that and say that this is a hila, hila being a ruse or a subterfuge. Uh, but generally, uh, most scholars accept the, the, the fact that when it's structured in a given way, it is Sharia compliant. So that would be a way, for example, if you want to buy a car, instead of uh, going to the car dealer and buy a car and then go to the bank to finance it, uh, the bank would be the merchant. The, buy, the bank will buy the car and resell it to you. And that would uh, be okay given that uh, the central uh, prohibition comes from a Quranic verse that says that uh, trade, making money from trade is okay, but, uh, but making money from money lending is a sin. And therefore, once you structure a transaction as a sales transaction, it can be acceptable. Another example would be leasing. So that would that is generally regarded as acceptable, uh, and uh, because it doesn't deal upfront with the question of interest. Now, many economists uh, are skeptical about uh, these claims, saying that it is uh, again it is uh, something of a hila. But increasingly, I think that there have been uh, some ways of uh, making sure that the way in which those transactions are structured has elements of profit and loss sharing, which is really what the ideal of Islamic finance is about. So the, uh, the, the proponents of Islamic finance basically say, we realize that there are some flaws in our model, but at least we're moving in the right direction because over time we may be able to contrive the kind of instruments that would be, uh, again, more intellectually satisfying. Yep. I have a question about uh, sovereign wealth funds, uh, especially in the Gulf. They say in, uh, at the end of the decade there might be, what, 10 trillion or so. Mm -hmm. Currently in the Gulf, uh, a lot of the Islamic finance is uh, mainly through private investors and private individuals. If these um, Gulf governments, in their efforts to sustain power, need further legitimization and there's this impetus amongst their populations to Islamize, um, what do you think is the implication for global finance? And in 10 years, what do you see uh, happening with these trillions of dollars? Will they be shifting in different ways? Will there be pressures put on um, uh, how they're invested? Mm -hmm. No, that's an important uh, question, considering the size of the sovereign wealth funds. Typically, uh, especially there have been a few instances where some sovereign wealth funds invested in uh, some dubious instruments. Typically, for example, they'd be the purchase of some hotel chains. And in those hotel chains, uh, there might be subsidiaries that, are, uh, that own casinos, etc. Or there's a question of serving alcohol within those hotels, et cetera. And the typical response of the sovereign wealth funds whenever these announcements uh, would be made is that we realize that there are some un-Islamic components, but we're going to try and phase them out. And we're going to try and move in the direction of, um, of Sharia-compliant investments. And at this time, given our size, uh, the size of the Sharia compliance sector is too small to allow us uh, to concentrate on that, but we're going to try and move in that direction as well as trying to, uh, to increase uh, the, the percentage of Sharia compliant instruments. Now, this has been uh, a vexing issue uh, for a while whenever people had a lot of money because uh, historically, uh, before Islamic finance existed, there were a number of different ways in which Muslim merchants 
and uh, rich investors, etc., were dealing with that issue. Uh, one way, there were a number of fatwas to that effect. Uh, there was the, the, the view that uh, uh, in the absence of Sharia-compliant institutions, it would be okay to deal with, uh, with uh, ribawi banks, so banks that uh, deal with, uh, with interest. And then there was something that many rich people did in places like Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, which was basically to take the, the interest and donate it to charity, or in some instances, which kind of made the banks very happy, tell the banks, uh, we won't take interest. Uh, so there were a number of variations in terms of the old model, but for a, for a country like Saudi Arabia, it was always a dilemma because Saudi Arabia essentially lives off its rent uh, in economic terms, which is all the money that it has uh, based on its oil income. And uh, so it was uh, always the kind of question that uh, went unresolved, except that, uh, again, the official line typically would be, we will try to do less and less of it. And for now, there's the question of darura as well as maslaha, that is, we have economic development needs. And therefore, we don't want to, uh, to let, uh, again, the international financial community keep all the interests that have acc accrued. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, do you find that the accommodative nature of the way Islamic finance is run today uh, to be a hindrance towards moving towards that ideal that, that you were talking about a little bit earlier? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a good question because um, even within the Islamic community, there have always been people who have been arguing that Islamic finance is not necessary. That is, uh, that uh, you could uh, find alternatives such as uh, various forms of mutual banking that would be perfectly acceptable. For example, one of the big names in the study of Islamic finance is Mahmoud Al-Gamal, who teaches at Rice University. And uh, Al-Gamal, uh, has been arguing that, uh, that all of those Islamic contracts are essentially uh, a distraction and uh, make some Sharia advisors uh, rich uh, without necessarily getting to the core of Islamic belief. So there are lots of debates going on. But my view of that is that because of the big financial meltdown starting in 2008, uh, Islamic finance was given a new legitimacy because uh, although Islamic banks did suffer a bit, uh, it was nowhere near what happened to conventional banks where, uh, as you know, whether it's in the US or Europe or elsewhere, uh, the entire global financial system was essentially bankrupt. And uh, the, the prior perspective on uh, Islamic finance was basically why reinvent the wheel? And we don't really, that we, we have a financial system that's working very nicely. Uh, why create one that would impose additional costs, such as, uh, again, the cost of having Sharia uh, scholars, etc and devising special contracts. So there was, uh, especially among, uh, uh, among like young Muslims, there were lots of people uh, who were saying that uh, this is uh, such a ridiculous uh, thing to create those institutions. And then what happened uh, post uh, the, the meltdown is that uh, uh, Islamic banks did quite well in comparison that is, there had been no need to, uh, to rescue the, the Islamic sector, et cetera, for a very simple reason, which is that Islamic banks were very conservative. And there's an, one element which used to be true of all forms of finance a long time ago, which is that the main risk with finance is to steer away from the real economy. There's always a temptation, and it has always existed, which is one reason why all religious traditions uh, are skeptical on the matter of, of interest, etc. historically. Uh, that there was always the view that, uh, that 
financiers uh, left to their own devices are going to try and engage in speculation, etc., and not in productive activities. So in Islamic banks, uh, despite, again, some of the controversial things they did in terms of some of the arrangements that I talked about earlier, uh, the, the view is that uh, there was a Sharia board that was there to keep them on the straight and narrow. And uh, I've written a few things on that. And my, my take on it is that uh, the existence of those Sharia scholars uh, uh, prevented Islamic banks from doing the real risky stuff that came with virtual finance. Because typically, uh, every time uh, banks would go to those scholars and say, we want to get in those derivatives, et cetera, uh, the Sharia scholars played a role of checks and balances. Because basically, they would ask a very basic question, which is, what for? What is the purpose of those uh, instruments? And here, in terms of modern finance, the way in which modern finance has evolved, nobody ever asked those questions. There was this view, and part of it comes from the intellectual influence of this university in the world of economics and finance, that uh, the market knows best, and there's the efficient market theory. So in other words, to quote Alexander Pope, whatever is, is good. There was a view that, again, whatever appears in the market is necessarily good, which was not the perspective of, uh, of Islamic banks. So I think that uh, that gave a lot of self-confidence. In my opinion, maybe too much self-confidence because one problem with finance is that the default setting in finance is a look for panaceas. That is, there's always the view that it's like one instrument and we're all going to rush headlong into that instrument. And there is something of a similar boom in terms of Islamic finance uh, that is happening because of this uh, newfound uh, self-confidence. But I think uh, one way that uh, Islamic finance has also derived some legitimacy is that uh, many people from outside of the Islamic world have recognized that the model has some merit. And this model had been disappearing, whereby every bank wanted to become a hedge fund and uh, do very risky things. So if you have institutions that still uh, keep an eye on uh, financing the real, uh, the real economy, et cetera. It's, it's a good thing overall. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you for the talk so far. It's been very beneficial. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask was um, regarding, and you, you mentioned this briefly, is the tension kind of between this idea of social justice, but also getting in line when, this, when these Islamist parties come into power, getting in line with the IMF and World Bank prescriptions, which have sort of like a liberal free market implication to them in terms of you know class consciousness, which happens in their society. And I was wondering, how are these, how is the AKP in particular in Turkey, and how do you think that the, the Muslim Brotherhood will be kind of dealing with this, you know, on the one hand, you know, their commitment to, I don't know, maybe populism we can call it, um, you know, and social justice, but on the other hand, keeping in line with international sort of economic norms. Mm -hmm. um, and also, maybe as an aside, could you also talk uh, briefly about the thought of Mohammed Baghar Sadr? Has his book made any kind of influence on this arena? Um, so, next. Yeah, uh, to start with the second part of your questions, uh, again, those of you who are serious about studying economic Islam should probably read uh, a book titled Iqtisaduna, written by uh, Muhammad Bakr al-Sadr who was an important figure in terms of the Shia community in Iraq and uh, was killed, uh, I think, in 1980 uh, by the regime of Saddam Hussein. And it's a big book that is very interesting to read. And a central part of this book is essentially to say that uh, we have communism and then we have capitalism and uh, Islam, or economic Islam, should be neither. Uh, but then he uh, strikes a balance uh, between, again, uh, private property and having a free enterprise system, but at the same time introducing the notion of altruism, uh, which has pretty much disappeared. There's this kind of a bit of a greed is good ethos. Uh, there was actually, probably most of you may know the the film Wall Street and uh, the speech made by uh, 
by uh, Michael Douglas, where he says, and by the way, greed is good, etc. Now, what you may not know is that this was based on a real life event, which was uh, at uh, Berkeley, my alma mater, uh, whereby uh, Ivan Boski was, who was a famous uh, uh, kind of convicted felon, but at the time he was seen as a genius uh, arbitrageur because he was, uh, uh, he was bu buying companies and making a lot of money. So he was uh, making this uh, commencement address to the business school at Berkeley. And he had this kind of typical speech that commencement speakers make, except that at one point he departed from it and he told those business students, and by the way, you should know that greed is all right. You can be greedy and feel good about yourself, etc. which I think is... Uh, is an important turning point in terms of the study of the culture of, uh, of, of, of finance. And so uh, one way in which you can uh, uh, differentiate, again, even for the right-wing Islamists who say that, uh, that actually uh, you could, uh, that actually, and there's, uh, like in my book, I, I did quote this, uh, this uh, Sudanese Minister of Finance was a disciple of Milton Friedman, where he argued that this model of, uh, of the economy is what Islam is all about. The reality is that no matter how you look at it, the element of the kind of, the kind of greed is good element, or the element that would say that greed is what drives the system, is certainly not representative of the Islamic view, because in the Islamic view, there's the acceptance of the notion of profit, but the notion of altruism is equally important, and it has to be there. Uh, so the uh, so back to your uh, uh, ba back to your question. What was the first part of the question? Uh, the kind of the conflicts that are happening when these Islamist parties accept IMF prescriptions. Oh yeah, and between you know their. So, so again, here it's uh, kind of muscle, a mix of maslaha and darura arguments, whereby on the one hand you say, well, it's our only option. It's either that or poverty uh, throughout the country, etc. So, so we need to make some some concessions, and uh, the uh, uh, at, at the same time, there's always the view that uh, once we are strong enough uh, and self-sufficient enough then we can put in practice uh, many of those, uh, many of those uh, goals. So there's, a, it's a very pragmatic issue. Now incidentally, my own take on uh, what might happen is that ideally, uh, if uh, political and economic Islam are normalized in the sense that once uh, certain parties come to power, then, uh, the people tend to realize that they cannot really perform miracles. And uh, the one reason why Islamists have done so well in elections is that they were so suppressed and repressed for a very long time that uh, they were never put to the test of resolving all of those big uh, issues. So I think ideally, uh, if uh, uh, Islamist parties are allowed to play the political game uh, then it's going to have a moderating effect on the more extreme side of that. Now, some people might say, but what about Iran and its regime? Well, one could argue that uh, the religious component is not really what is driving the policies of, of Iran. That is, you can see similar uh, policies in other countries that are not Islamic in terms of populism and the like. So it may be a factor but it's really not the, the most important factor. Uh, thank you again for being here. Um, okay. Actually, my question kind of has to do with the last point you made. Um, President Bani Sadr in uh, Iran, uh, would you say his, the resistance to uh, his policies were more against his economic policies, or was it more, did it have a religious base, or is is, are those two things kind of difficult to um, separate? And then additionally, does that say something about the larger um, political society in Iran? Mm -hmm. 
Well, again, if I were to explain what was going on in Beni Sadra's head, uh, I think it's a mix of that was, uh, again, the mood of the times. Uh, that was, uh, like most people, were very much uh, uh, kind of politically on the left, especially if they were students in, in France. Uh, but at the same time, you had this interesting convergence of uh, religion and left-wing policies among many uh, Iranian uh, intellectuals. And it was, I think, probably if there was one factor which I think is uh, significant, is the resistance to the Shah's policies. Uh, and given that the Shah was closely associated with the idea of secularism, uh, whereas Khomeini and the rest of the clergy uh, looked like they were providing some moral leadership. Uh, so there was this attraction uh, of, um, of the religious element that went hand in hand with the attraction of the, uh, of the political component and being kind of uh, in opposition and having a form of resistance. Because uh, I, I said that I look, uh, I wouldn't say I read the book because it was pretty much unreadable, but I looked at, at the book and I didn't think that intellectually it was, uh, it was very convincing. Uh, but at the same time, it, is, uh, it was an interesting analysis. Again, he related the notion of Tawheed with kind of a Marxist view. Uh, now, I guess if you're a Marxist, then you can, you, you can think that anything uh, anywhere is, uh, is, is a form of uh, kind of it, it, uh, it, that it justifies uh, Marxist theories. So, and I, I think it's true of all ideologues. Certainly the, the free market ideologues uh, fall in the same trap of seeing, uh, again, uh, the perfect market at work everywhere. Um, and, uh, but, but again, I don't think the, uh, I think again, in that sense, the writings of Shariati are more interesting because they tend to combine uh, religion and left-wing politics in a more convincing way uh, than, uh, than Bani Sadr did. But that, that would be kind of an interesting thing. I know that uh, uh, like uh, those of you who are students, it might be a good, uh, a good topic for theses and the like to, uh, to, to look at that and try to make sense of it. Because again, for a while, Benny Sadr, as the first uh, post-revolution president, was, uh, was an important figure, but then he fell out with uh, Khomeini and then the, the purely theocratic element of the regime ended up dom dominating everything. So most of the other uh, political views ended up being, being marginalized. Hi. Uh, Hi. My, my question's based more around the implementation of Islamic banking in countries, and not, and not so much ones that are just coming out of the Arab Spring, but um, Oman recently, within the last few weeks or months, they've, they've started to move towards implementing Islamic banking uh -huh. by the end of the year, becoming the last GCC country to do so. Could, could that, their decision, which the regime there had been in power for over 40 years now, has been relatively resistant to Islamic banking, could their decision to move towards this be based in part on the, the merits of Islamic banking that have kind of become more visible since the financial meltdowns of, of the last few years? And, and what sort of challenges would a country like that face moving into this model from, from a relatively stable economic model that they've, mm -hmm. they've had? Well, well uh, I'm not sure I fully agree with the, the premise of your question, which is that, uh, that Jordan uh, has not, uh, is not one of the Arab Spring countries. Well, not, not, uh, not, not Jordan, um, Sultanate of Oman. Uh, uh, oh, 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 Oman, yeah. Oman, yeah. Okay, well, it's even a better question now that it's <laughs> Oman, because uh, Oman is probably the one country where demonstrators were, uh, were uh, had amongst their slogans and the signs they were carrying, uh, there was, we want Islamic banks. And uh, in Oman, uh, uh, Islamic banking had been banned. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a reaction. That, that was actually true of, of many countries where Islamic banking w was banned. And uh, there were some demonstrations early in this uh, Arab Spring uh, movement. And this is when uh, the government decided to introduce Islamic banks. So technically, it is the one country where Islamic banking was actually quite central to that. Uh, now, since I mentioned Jordan, let me just say a couple of things about that because it's another interesting phenomenon, which is that 
Uh, there are a number of governments, including in Morocco, in Jor Jordan, and elsewhere, which have been seeing the handwriting on the wall on the matter of uh, rebellion and uh, uh, kind of reactions to economic uh, misery and the like. And uh, many of those countries have tried to preempt or prevent uh, such revolutions by uh, making some concessions, including to, uh, to Islamist countries. So, uh, so in both Jordan, yeah, in Jordan there they used to be a couple of Islamic banks, and right now they're broadening the system. Their laws has been changed, uh, have been changed to to allow more Islamic banking. Uh, Morocco is a country where Islamic uh, banking was banned, and now uh, new legislation is being introduced. So it's a way of telling uh, Islamist parties, we're not repressing you anymore. Uh, having said that, I think that uh, especially among the, what you might call the modernizers within all those countries, uh, there aren't too many people who are convinced of the merits of Islamic banking. My, my own take on Islamic banking is that the main merit of Islamic banking is to keep uh, the financial system tethered to the real economy. That was, uh, and, and prohibiting the, uh, all the speculation and, and all the rest. Uh, but uh, since I spent a lot of time with, uh, with young uh, bankers who are interested in Islamic finance as a market opportunity, not anything beyond that, and uh, spending a lot of time explaining that to them, uh, I always feel like I'm in a minority of one by, uh, by saying that this is the one good thing. Because the other thing, as I said earlier, I don't think, I think that panaceas are dangerous by definition. Uh, if you were kind of a smaller side here, if you look at uh, microfinance, for example, which many people have regarded as a panacea, I think it was initially a brilliant idea provided it is circumscribed and it, it doesn't become a panacea when you attract everybody. And then there have been a number of uh, disastrous consequences to kind of the, the free entry of anybody who wanted to do it into uh, microfinance. So I think the same thing would apply to Islamic finance. Once you regard it as a panacea, then you have a bubble effect that will uh, follow. And uh, with bubble effects come all sorts of negative uh, consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Um, can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I, my question was, um, I, I mean, it's, it's a very vague question, but I, I wanted to know what you thought, what lessons we're learning from what happened, what's happened in, in Palestine in, I guess, the past seven years uh, with Hamas coming into power, really the first Islamist party to win an election in the Middle East in this recent wave uh, of transition of power it, as a result of Fatah corruption and um, all these other reasons, not necessarily because of Hamas's policies, but as a alternative. Um, and then it, everything from that point till now, and what we see in essentially a comparison of the West Bank, which is, you know, flooded with foreign aid, nonprofits uh, working, and the economy supposedly doing well, but actually, it, you know, it's it's really very obvious that it's a foreign aid bubble. And then you have Gaza, which is completely cut off. Um, you know, having to work, get its supplies through tunnels and such, and Hamas ruling as an Islamist party. And if there are any economic lessons we can mm. learn that in relation to the Islamist ideas, uh, or I guess Islamist policies, and and the politics of foreign aid and everything else that comes with that, that situation. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as uh, Hamas is concerned, I don't think there's much about economics per se, because it's all about politics. And uh, the, uh, as you mentioned, I think uh, one reason why, uh, uh, why Hamas has, has done well in the last kind of freely, free election or freely contested election, et cetera, because there, there, there have been other uh, not kind of uh, situations where people were asked to vote, but then uh, either kind of one, one party was not running or one was boycotting, et cetera. So there were all sorts of complicated things. But back in, I think it was 2005 or so, uh, the, um, the typical uh, reason why uh, uh, lots of people voted 
for Hamas uh, was uh, that they were disappointed in uh, what was going on uh, through the, 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 the PLO, essentially, the, the Palestinian Authority. And uh, so it was more of a rejection vote. At the same time, there is, uh, it's, it's a very, very interesting thing that is what's going on in the, in, uh, the occupied territories, which is uh, that, that I think that uh, the, the actual leeway of any regime is greatly limited by, again, initially it was the occupation, and now it is the kind of the state of siege, or whatever you may want to call it, that the Palestinians live, live under, which makes it nearly impossible to have uh, kind of a coherent policy to begin with. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the Islamic uh, component uh, is there in the rhetoric, but I think in practice, again, when you're, uh, when you have to survive under very difficult uh, circumstances, you have very little by way of, uh, again, leeway in terms of uh, establishing policies based on kind of an ideal view of, of government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.